That was a perfect introduction. Good job. Great. And we should be recording now. We should be recording. I may regret it later, but we should be recording. It'll be a lesson for all of us. So I have to give you, I, I talk fast because I feel like uh, in 25 minutes, this is going to be rough. But uh, these 18 pages is the short version. Okay, this is the fourth, the fourth time through and I thought I just got to fly through this thing to get to the meat of the uh, to the meat of the matter. So uh, the original topic was how men heal. I know how I heal and I've seen other men heal. And so I and and they heal in some ways that I've healed. So I feel as though I have something to share. Um, and I'm ad living and to share that it's possible there is hope it's not easy it takes courage um, but here we go um how many of you just for fun just for fun yeah right fun how many of you came from a dysfunctional family <laughs> all right ding 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 you win the you win the prize yeah me too me too alcoholic dad codependent mom deep depression Seven kids, we're all fighting for scraps. There was one girl and six boys. We, re we referred to growing up as the princess and the pigs. It was also, could have been the um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and I would have been bashful. Uh, and all the others would have taken, taken place too. Um, so I'm, I'm not naive to think that my suffering was any worse than anybody else's. And in fact, in many ways, I feel I got off easy. I was not physically abused. My brothers were. Um, if there was anything, there was just neglect. And there's increasing amounts of research on the trauma of neglect. Uh, you sort of grow up, my experience was, I'm not even looking at this thing yet. Um, my experience was, why isn't anybody noticing that I'm here? And we make up stories when we're children about why the world is working the way it is. And for me, it was, oh, there is something wrong with me. There's something so terribly wrong with me that even my dad doesn't notice. And my siblings were all fighting for emotional scraps. And I would blend into the woodwork and like nobody would notice. And just, just I would sit for hours and I would come home from school and sit in for hours in front of the television set and to squelch my loneliness or something because there was something inside that was missing with a big bowl of ice cream and then my brothers would walk in i'd be watching tv i had every well, of course we only had three channels every television channel memorized as to what day and time my brothers would walk in and they'd look at me and say and my back then my nickname was dicky not richard and they would tap the top of the television and say hey dicky how's the television today you know so it, there was a lot of teasing and cajoling. My oldest brother, Robert, uh, rest in peace, used to say, but Richard or Dickie, we wouldn't tease you if we didn't love you. And I would say, don't love me that much. You know, you can back off the, the thing. So my experience is not unique, especially in our culture where men, boys, it's getting better. I'm aware of that. But people in my generation grew up being told and pressured by family and society to be tough. The Marlboro Man, you know, stoic, deal with the pain, walk it off, you know, don't cry, don't be a baby, don't be a wimp. And, the, and, and for me, and I think many men, what that means is we have to squelch those feelings and numb out. And what I know about numbing is, and I've read, and it's certainly been true with me, is that you can't just numb the negative feelings and enjoy the positive feelings. When you numb the negative, you numb it all. So throughout, uh, which remind, and it's so pervasive that people write songs about it, or at least one song about it. And it ends like this. I am a rock. I am an island. I have my books and my poetry to protect me. I am shielded in my armor, hiding in my room, 
safe within my womb. I touch no one and no one touches me. I am a rock. I am an island. And a rock feels no pain. And an island never cries. True or false? From the men you know, do they cry easily? Do they feel deeply? Do they express it easily? Some do, some don't. And it all depends on you know, their experiences. My experience was I numbed out. Um, I'm going to skip that. You'll be glad. Uh, I managed to avoid a lot of the physical punishment that went on in my family. Uh, just because I had six older siblings and I kind of got to see what happens. So I had that lesson. I'm like, I ain't going there. You know, but it, particularly by the time I was five, my dad was drinking pretty heavy and we all learned to stay out of the house. Uh, and even when he was home, not knowing if he was going to be on a dry drunk or what kind of mood he's in. Uh, but it was the kind of thing that today's standards, he would be arrested. Um, but that was common too. Everybody we knew was getting whippings. Um, so one of the consequences is in that growing up of what's wrong with me? I don't even know what it is. I had imagined, you know, if you can imagine like, you know, this big L on my forehood, you know how many, if you have kids that get the invisible, the spy thing with the little invisible ink and then you shine the ultraviolet light on it. And I swear, I was just like walking around with this big L on my forehead. It's like, they see it? I don't know why. I'll never know when they figure it out. So I better stay small. I better stay, don't talk, don't assert yourself, don't risk, don't get involved in the things that now looking back, I know would have given my life joy. Don't get into band, don't play sports, don't uh, get in the chorus, don't do drama, um, you know, all of that stuff. So, and I worked. I worked so that I had an excuse not to go to football games and basketball games. I think I went to one football game in my high school career. I walked home from lunch because I was so concerned that if I walked in the cafeteria in high school, I wouldn't have anyone invite me to sit down. So it's easier to avoid that. So, um, so what's the solution? Well, everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants love. So in my case, I did what I could to become something of an imposter. I dressed cool, uh, grew my hair long, uh, played golf, if you call that a sport. Um, and people didn't know what to make of me. So because they knew so little of me personally, and they just thought, they make up stories. Well, he's cool, or he's good looking, or he's a nice guy, or he's, 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 a, he's a brain. You know, I'm like, oh my God. Um, and then, uh, so I, I tried to fit in to the degree without really becoming personal. And I really need someone to keep the, an eye on the time for me. I did get a reprieve though in high school. At the end of my junior year, I found Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because you know what's great about religion? Well, a number of things. In my case, I was involved in Christianity for three years. I was reading the Bible and going to prayer meetings, even evangelizing a little bit. But they have a rule. You have to love everybody. This is an easy audience. I can come here and I can feel like they like me and kind of pretend I don't know that rule exists. But the experience of being in a community for a first for those three years was the first time that I remember really feeling cared for, really feeling loved, really feeling like, oh, maybe I'm okay after all. That was my primary social outlet for three years. And after three years, I went, philosophically and logically, this isn't working. So I walked away. I walked away from my identity. I walked away from my social circle. I walked away from my belief system. And I'm like, oh my God. Now I'm back to where I don't have any friends. And I don't know what to think. But I did get something out of that religion as well as my Catholic upbringing. And that was, now true or not, it doesn't matter because it, it felt true to me. I felt and believed I am here for a reason. I am on this earth, thank you so much, I am on this earth for some 
purpose. And it might not be to make the world significantly better, but I'm here to learn something. I'm here to give something. And it sort of switched my thinking and saying, hey, you know, being the baby of a family of seven and with an alcoholic parent, there must be a reason that this happened. And, and so I started looking for the opportunities. I also started looking for opportunities when I looked around and I saw that other people were being successful. Do I talk too fast? Just slow me down if I die. Okay, good. Because I think we process words faster than most people can talk. So I started looking around, how do I fit in? How do I get to not better than anybody else, but how do I just get good enough? So I start reading self-help books and I start reading about philosophy and religion and the philosophy part uh, and the religious part, I read enough that, and I, what, what caught my attention, see, I hardly even look at this thing. So what caught my attention was the, I don't know what the word esoteric means, but I was looking at psychic phenomena and life after, uh, you know, ghosts and spirituality and Edgar Cayce and uh, Jane Roberts, the Seth books way back when, and then that transitioned into the law of attraction. And that's where I fit. I mean, that's what fits with me. That's a, it, it gives me a framework. And in that framework, I started feeling a little better because I had a purpose. And I found out later, about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, there's a guy named Seligman, Arthur Seligman, I think, who uh, was one of the original people spearheading positive psychology. And he says, you need five things to be happy. And he doesn't use happy, he says well-being. One of them, is purpose. And I lucked out because I had purpose. Now I didn't have the other four going for me, not yet. And the other four are positive emotions, fun. I don't know how to have fun. In my men's group, we're like, we don't know how to have fun. I mean, it's like a chore. You know, and I'm convinced I've heard this phrase, we should work a whole lot harder at having fun and a whole less effort put into work. And we'd be a lot happier. So positive emotions, and the next one is uh, engagement or flow. What do you get lost in? You know, I used to, I remember one time I spent 12 straight hours, two days in a row, completely taking apart my 12 speed and completely like, down to the ball bearings and putting it back. That was flow, nothing else mattered. If any of you contra dance, that's flow because you cannot think about anything else when you're trying to follow the instructions of right hand Alaman, do a figure eight, ladies chain and everything else. So that's flow, that's pretty fun too. Um, another one is uh, achievement, a sense of achievement. When you do something that you put your heart and soul in and you succeed at it, hope, like hopefully I'll feel like that in 15 minutes, um, it is just this rush, you know? So I started achieving things some along the line as I was learning how to be successful. Um, and listening to tapes and podcasts and uh, Brian Tracy and all these other people. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. So, um, oh wait, there's one more, right? Relationships. And he says, relationships, I think he said at one point, is the most important. You know, to feel loved, accepted, warts and all, and to get to a place where you can express and feel that love for someone else. It has taken a long time for me. I've made choices for relationships based in irrational old stuff. And, but with each one, I'm trying to get a little more rational, a little more clear. Um, and as you all know that Joe here has been in my life for about a year. We just celebrated our one year anniversary. Um, yeah of meeting, uh, not being um, intimate um, partners, but, um, and we give each other great joy. So I, I, I'm getting pretty close to getting that relationship thing. And I'll talk about that later. Uh, not that, relax. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, relationship, how, you know, whatever, I'll tell you later. Okay. So, so I'm reading all the self-help stuff to somehow try to make myself worthwhile. And in the process, I realized that this old stinking thinking that we're really just coping mechanisms to get through childhood, 
it just, I'm kind of, and then the thought is my dad died at 16. He was 47 years old. Depression runs in the family. His father committed suicide. His uncle committed suicide. Thank God my mother contributed to the genetic makeup because she's very kind, very loving, and seven kids, three are alcoholics, and they all got over it. I mean, not over it, but they all re re are recovered after 30 years, and we all had fairly productive, successful lives. But some of the things that I learned about how to be normal, how to be effective uh, at my job and, and in a social circle, were things like, um, hang on. Uh, you know, fake it till you make it. Uh, let's see, there was one, um, I'm looking at one, oh, these tapes, tapes about how to get along with difficult people. That was fun. How to negotiate at a yard sale. That was fun. You know, how, the one thing I remember about negotiating with difficult people, this has got nothing to do with healing, except for the fact that the opportunity, when you're negotiating and you choose to negotiate or deal with a difficult person, it takes courage because because we have been ingrained to not hurt people's feelings. Bull hockey. You know, I really don't believe we can hurt people's feelings. I think we trigger people's feelings. Nine, this, this type of counseling I was in years ago said, rarely does an adult experience new pain. It's old pain that's, re, that's triggered and brought up because you're doing something familiar, which is a very freeing kind of thing because I can say something and I can say it wrong. And if you get your feelings hurt, I go, well, that's interesting. You're angry? Do you mind if I go make popcorn? I want to enjoy the show. So, um, with the uh, getting along with difficult people, again, having to have a little bit of courage and confidence in the theory, and they keep interrupting you. You're having this great conversation, and what you do is you, as they interrupt, you say, kill them with kindness. My brother Paul used to say, you look at them and, I, and you say, excuse me, I wasn't finished yet. And they go, oh. And you're talking away, and another minute later, so they interrupt again. Well, when, when I was in it, I said, oh, excuse me, I wasn't finished yet. Well, after about three times, they have learned their lesson. You simply asserted yourself kindly and problem solved. So I learned a little bit about manners, professional etiquette. I learned, I, this is not in my script, and she read the second version, I think. And, uh, you know, so I learned a lot there. Here's what I learned from these uh, soothsayers of uh, uh, success and getting along. Assume full responsibility for your life. We don't always control what happens to us, but we control how we respond to it. I am in my life, I believe all of us are where we are in life as a result of the decisions that we have personally made based on our thinking and our emotions at the time. I have no one else to blame. It is not appropriate to have a pity party for yourself. Perseverance pays off. Habits can make you, oh my God, she's showing me her clock with the time. Habits can make you or break you, okay? And your thoughts can become your reality. I have embraced that one and I have done everything I can do to change my stinking thinking um, one of the places I went to, and this is a place where lots of people go to for their healing, and that's Al-Anon. On and off for years, initially just because of my dad, my first wife, you know, and other people in my life that I'm close to that really push my buttons. And they got some great phrases that I turned into mantras. Don't compare your, don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. Man, they look good. I have no idea what's going on in the inside. I looked pretty good. When I was in college, they were like, oh, Richard, you're so, and I'm like, oh, if you had any idea what was going on inside. And what other people think of me is none of my business. What you think of me at the end of this presentation is none of my business. Now, that's not sad. I won't love it if you come up to me and say, Richard, that was really great, but, <laughs> it should not affect how I feel about myself. Uh, an expectation is nothing more than a resentment waiting to happen. 
Fear is false expectations appearing real. Uh, when referring to somebody else's behavior that causes distress, I didn't create it, I can't control it, and I can't cure it. I give myself a, a way out. And of course, the serenity prayer. I got involved in some uh, peer counseling and it was, there were a number, this was, uh, we taught each, not we taught, they taught us how to share time and counsel one another, 99% of which was nothing more than just good listening. Because being listened to with that other person, looking at you with love in their eyes, full acceptance, I care about you, these are just feelings. You know, these are just, this is just old stuff and I'm here to listen, uh, was significant. And what I learned in there is that for that to happen, that kind of catharsis, whether one-on-one -on -one, uh, in our men's group, is that there has to be an atmosphere of extreme trust. At our men's uh, workshop, a retreat coming up, we all individually take a vow at the beginning of confidentiality, and nonviolence. This atmosphere has to be safe. Feelings are not an accurate reflection of reality. Thus, the stories in our head, which make us feel what we feel. Um, the fastest way of getting over fears, and I am a testament to this, I was painfully shy as a child. My kindergarten teacher told my mom I was abnormally shy. Who would know? Who would suspect? But the counseling helped a lot. It got me over a couple of things. Okay, this is like too much information, Richard. But I was just like insecure and self-conscious and I was pee shy. My brother would stand outside the bathroom. And he's like, we're listening. And I'm like, oh my God. And I'm, you know, I, in counseling, it was just like that teasing, that hardship. So I got over it. In fact, I'm not pee shy anymore. <laughs> I am pee proud. Yeah, you go, Richard. You made it. So men, um, I can't speak for or about women, but I know men have a hard time trusting because of that childhood experience of being don't, you know, you know, it's just humiliating to have to, the, the only way to survive for me was to numb it down, shut it down, try to look good. So over the time, it, as a result of that kept, uh, counseling, I got real more increase, a very difficult at first, but increasingly more comfortable feeling my emotions, recognizing the emotions. In fact, when I started up here, I thought, boy, this is interesting. From like here down, like imagine, uh, what do you call those, uh, those tubi, 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 yeah, tubi cartoons? Just this vibration, just this rumbling. You know, that's where I feel the emotion and I've learned to go, what's that? What are the words that go with that? And if I'm in a situation where I'm safe, and I'm often safe here, I'm often emotional up here, I'm not going to, I don't feel like I'm going to go there today. But, and I say the words, whatever that word is, and don't, we, we do that when we're talking, is this flow of consciousness. Um, okay, so having that ability to feel your feelings and let it out. Um, and I, you, you get increasingly more comfortable with feeling that and sharing that with people who have earned the right to hear it. It is not about being vulnerable to everybody on the street. It's let them earn the right. And those probably be very few people in your life. Um, I did want to, as I, as I fill, uh, here we go. One of the things, I've, I've been a big fan of uh, Imago dialogue, Imago, you know, conversation, communication, uh, trying to really hone those skills and understanding what makes that work. And to me, it makes sense that whether it's a men's group, support group, or in your relationship, Difficult conversations have to be had, and for me, having a structure like an Imago Dialogue 
um, in an atmosphere of trust. And by that trust, I mean, ah, that some ground rules in the conversation, and those ground rules create that atmosphere of trust, and the key components of that, thank you, Brene Brown, are boundaries. Can I, if it gets too hot, can I leave and come back? I, I have friends, I know people who say, you're not leaving, you're gonna sit here, and we're gonna talk this through. Boy, you wanna shut a guy down? That'll do it. Um, reliability. Do I say what I do? Do I do what I say I'm gonna do? Accountability, do I own up when I make a mistake? Um, the vault. If, what, if you want me to share with you what is important and precious to me, it had better be precious to you. Because if you break the vault, there will never be trust. There will always be that lingering thing in the back of my mind. Integrity. Is this a person or a group that does the right thing even when it's difficult to do? Non-judgment and generosity. Um, having the space to say, you may have made a mistake, it may not be working, but I know you're doing your best. I know you're trying. I honor that you are trying your best. So look at this, page six to 17 and 18. So, um, so the trust is incredibly important in any kind of sharing situation. And that has helped me heal. It has helped me be, uh, your alarm's gonna go off here any second. Uh, so here's the summary. Many of us, it's all about, for me, it has been all about self-worth and curing that self-worth, curing that, healing that part of us that was damaged when young. And the fear of being enough or good enough in one capacity or another gets triggered regularly. And my sometimes, my mantra sometimes, hard to believe, is I am worthy of love and connection and knowing that I belong wherever I go. They may not think so, but I think I belong there. Morristown, for one. They needed me. They couldn't, you know. Uh, healing happens in relationship. It's hard to heal on your own. I don't I think it's impossible to heal on your own. You have to have somebody reflecting back that you're a worthwhile person. And feel the fear. It's just an emotion. And do it anyway. You know, get some courage. How many of you are Star Wars fans? Okay, a little bit. Okay. There's a line in Star Wars, I forget which one, and it says uh, Yoda is telling Luke, the treasure you seek is in the cave you fear the most. And that's certainly true for me. So it's only fear. It's only a feeling. Um, I tried to instill a lot of this wisdom in my last five years of teaching, which made it very interesting. And I'm almost done, so now we're going to, I want you to do one thing for me, and then I'm done. Okay, ready? I want you to stand up. I love doing this stuff because we don't often do this. Stuff. You don't know what's coming, do you? <laughs> now, I want you to, and this, this is uh, uh, four lines out of a song from Kevmo. And I want you to turn to somebody, whether you know them or not, it's not important. This is not a personal to share your deepest, darkest secret. But turn to somebody because you're going to repeat after me looking at somebody else. And if there's not an even number, find, get in a group of three, okay? Or four or five or six. Okay, so here you go. We're almost done. First, first phrase, repeat after me. I'm amazing. I'm incredible. I'm a miracle. I'm a dream come true. I'm marvelous. I'm beautiful. I'm beautiful. Guess what? So are you. Don't ever forget it. So are you. And may the force be with you. Thank you, Richard.